On this episode of Women Behind Bars, sisters Donna Duggins and Jeannie Moore were convicted of attempting to have Donna's husband beaten to death with a hammer. After going in and seeing the crime scene, the amount of blood, the way the scene looked, I remember telling the officers, we don't have a missing person, we have a homicide. Then Evelyn Jackson tells her story. She and two friends pled guilty to torturing and drowning an acquaintance. The whole thing was brought up by jealousy. Two women in love with the same man. The original plan was just to fight her, get her in the car, go to the back docks and leave her there. Never was our motive to kill this girl. Three women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of sisters Donna Duggins and Jeannie Moore and Evelyn Jackson. Around 11 p.m. on May 30th, 1996, 32-year-old Donna Duggins claimed she came home from picking up fast food to find her husband missing and a gruesome trail of blood leading outside. There was blood all over the house, and I grabbed the phone and went outside and got in my car and stayed there until the police got there. Police Department, ma'am. Now go back and there's blood all over our house. The following morning, Donna's husband, Dean, was found dumped 30 feet off a dirt road. The policeman told me he heard something grunting like a dog, and he looked down there and saw me trying to get up. Dean had been bludgeoned with a hammer and left for dead. He was in his briefs and maybe a T-shirt. He was covered in blood and crawling around in the field. After a six-week investigation, 35-year-old Eddie Morgan turned himself in and confessed to attempted murder. He claimed Donna and her sister Jeannie hired him for $1,000, but the sisters say they knew nothing about the attack. I never talked to Eddie about doing anything to Dean. They cut a deal with him that if he put us in to helping him, that they would cut his time. We thought it was Donna's idea to kill Dean. Donna was involved in the background of it and getting Jeannie to do this and do this. Did Donna Duggins and her sister Jeannie Moore plot the murder of Dean Duggins? Or were they implicated in a crime they did not commit? My family was blessed with two of the best parents any kids could have. That was the happiest years of my life. Jeannie Moore was one of five children. Her sister Donna, the youngest, came along in 1964. I had a great childhood, and I, could, I have no complaints. I went to skating every night and played softball. I always was doing something positive. Neither sister flourished academically. They both dropped out of high school and were married with kids by the age of 18. My first husband, he beat on me, and so I left. I traded him my car for my kid, for my child. Then I got married again to a drunk. He beat me for five years, and finally I just had enough of it. All I ever wanted to do, you know, was have somebody to love me. I took my kids and I left. I wanted to get out on my own. I think at that time, I just wanted to be married and have a family. In the mid-80s, Donna and Jeannie's father, Gene, opened his own ink company in Kernersville, North Carolina, and brought the family with him. Donna began to prosper and bought a home, but Jeannie turned to smoking pot and continued her streak of hooking up with abusive men. Jeannie couldn't find a good one if she was hunting one. Every one she found was bad. One of those men, according to Ronnie, was Eddie Morgan. The 35-year-old had been arrested several times on drug charges. Jeannie introduced me to him. And I told her he was bad news. You could look at him and tell he was. In 1993, Donna met Dean Duggins, a handsome construction worker in the throes of a divorce. When I got with Dean, we both we were soulmates because everything he liked to do, I loved to do. 
and I ended up leaving my husband. He moved in with me for a year, and then we got married. And he came to work for my father. But according to Donna, the marriage had its rough moments. When he was straight, he was as good as gold. He was the best person you could ever meet. Merry Christmas! Ho, ho, ho! And Merry Happy Christmas. New Year! And Happy New Year! Then when Dean was drinking a lot, it, it made him a bad person. He seemed like a nice guy in the beginning. As things kind of progressed, he had a very bad temper. And when he would drink and stuff, he would just get crazy. I wasn't abusive. I did drink some. Of course, she drank some, too. And I wouldn't say we drank too much. The couple separated for six months. But on Valentine's Day, 1996, Dean moved back in with Donna. He said he settled down, and he had settled down. We both wanted to make it work. The day that it happened, he worked late. And he had asked me to go and get him something from Burger King. He was watching a ball game. Donna said she was going to Burger King. She said, here, take your pee and you sleep better. And I went to bed, and next thing I remember, I wake up in the hospital. When I came back in the house, all I seen was blood all over the kitchen floor. I didn't see Dean. I didn't see my daughter. I ran up the stairs and went in the bedroom, and there was blood everywhere. So I ran back downstairs and called the police. It was the worst nightmare of my entire life. <laughs> I called my mom's house. They thought it was my sister on the phone, Jenny. So they said they went to her house. I arrived on the scene about 11.15. After going in and seeing the crime scene, the amount of blood, the way the scene looked, I remember telling the officers, we don't have a missing person, we have a homicide. Police spent about 12 hours processing the crime scene. There was a skull fragment found on the bed a trail of blood from the bed to the front door and throughout the house. Donna was real upset about it. She was scared because, as far as I know, she had no idea what was happening. She had a receipt from Burger King where she had went and got their hamburgers in the kitchen on the bar, still in the sack. At about 2 AM, Detective Leonard and other law enforcement officers questioned Donna and her family. Everybody was interviewed, including the wife's mother. At that point, we didn't know if he had been hit with something or if he'd even been shot. Detective Leonard believed if there was foul play, Donna would be a suspect. Based on what I saw and the time she gets up to go get something to eat, she's gone 20 minutes and comes back to this. The fact that she called her mom before calling 911, I found suspicious also. When Women Behind Bars continues, I could actually see his brain. He has a hole in his skull where he's been hit. On the night of May 30th, 1996, 32-year-old Donna Duggins came home to find her husband Dean missing and a house covered in blood. Police immediately suspected a possible homicide the next day, they interviewed the family, including Donna and her older sister, Jeannie Moore. It was 8, 8.30 in the morning. The police department gets a call from a bus driver who had seen the car sitting on the side of the road. The officers get there. The passenger door's open, but Dean's not there. They start hearing a moaning noise, and they find Dean over in a brushy field. It appeared that he was left inside the car. Some point comes to, gets out of the car, and then just gets out into this field, falls down, and you can see where he's just rolling around and crawling. Detective Leonard arrived at the scene. I could actually see his brain. He has a hole in his skull where he's been hit. I couldn't believe he was still alive. The cold night is what the doctor says probably saved him. Dean was airlifted to the hospital in Winston-Salem. 
A couple of the detectives tried to talk to him, but he couldn't talk. He was just barely conscious. There was a claw hammer laying at the rear of the car, which did turn out to be the weapon used, and a lot of blood in the car. Doctors believed Dean had a slim chance of surviving. I lost 30% of my brain matter, and I guess it was hanging out. It broke my jaw. I lost all these bottom teeth on my left side. When Donna first saw her husband, she says she was shocked. His face was all swollen. His hands were swollen. He just mumbled it, you know, kept saying, I love you, I love you. So then I signed the papers, and they did surgery on him. I was in coma for a day or two, I think. My back was the biggest thing that bothered me, where I was drug across the concrete. I had to have a plate put in my head. I had to keep going back. I, I guess I had probably a half a dozen surgeries. But Dean had other worries besides his injuries. He says that police told him that they considered his wife, Donna, a possible suspect. I didn't want to believe it. So she'd come to the hospital every day and stay in there right by my side and tell me how much she loved me and how much she wanted me to get better and get back home and get back to work. If I didn't want Dean, he would have left. We had broke up six months before, and we worked every day, and we were fine with each other. It would have been no benefit to me. I mean, there was no reason for that to happen to him. A month later, Dean was finally released from the hospital. His parents insisted that he move back home. Dean asked me, Donna, will you go to their house? I said, whatever you want to do. So we went to his parents' house and stayed. And his daddy would be sitting there all night long with a gun. And he'd be jumping up, looking out the window. And while Donna was staying here, my parents left in shifts to make sure she didn't do anything to finish me off. In June, authorities got the break they had been waiting for. A witness told them that Jeannie's daughter bought a bus ticket for 35-year-old Eddie Morgan, Jeannie's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Jeannie tells the witness that he's coming up here to beat Dean up. Police also learned that Jeannie took Eddie back to South Carolina the day after the attempted murder. In light of this new information, Detective Leonard picked Jeannie up at work for further questioning. We asked her about the, the bus ticket, and she denied getting anybody a bus ticket. They questioned me 12 hours straight, and I kept telling them, I can't tell you what I don't know. Jeannie finally admitted to purchasing the ticket for Eddie, but she still claimed she never asked him to hurt Dean and that she took him home the day before the attack. And she tells us nothing about what the witness had told us that on the day after the incident. At their request, he drove in his car and they all took Eddie back and come back home. Six weeks after the murder attempt and an intensive manhunt, Eddie Morgan finally turned himself in to authorities. He confessed to assaulting Dean and named Jeannie and her sister Donna as his accomplices. We go to the sheriff's department and Eddie was there sitting on the bench smoking a cigarette. I remember him saying, I'm ready to tell you everything I know. I'm tired of running. I'm ready to get this over with. Eddie admitted that Jeannie got him the bus ticket and that he spent the night with her. The next morning, when Jeannie first broached the subject of attacking Dean, Morgan said his first reaction was no. Jeannie then brought Eddie some beer for breakfast and vodka for lunch. By the time she gets home from work, he said he's pretty drunk. She starts telling him that uh, Dean had been pushing Donna around at work. If Jeannie had told him when this is over with, we'll get married. He was in love with Jeannie. I think Eddie's words were, let's go kick his ass. My sister, she might have made comments on what he was doing to me, but I do not believe she come out and asked him. I never talked to Eddie about doing anything to Dean because I didn't even know he was even planning anything like this. According to Eddie, Jeannie proceeded to drop him off near the Duggins house. He walked up to the residence and entered through the rear doors. Donna's at the pool table, and in his words, he asked, where's his son at? She tells him he's upstairs in the bed. Eddie says that he was drunk, but he does remember going into the bedroom. He's standing over Dean, and hits him in the head with a hammer. Hits him two or three times, maybe four. So him and Donna, they get Dean out of the bed, drag him down the hall, out the back door, around to Dean's vehicle, put him in the passenger seat, 
she tells Eddie, take Dean in the car and get it out of here. She says, follow Jeannie. So he follows Jeannie to a dirt road. Eddie went on to say that he abandoned the car and the two returned to Jeannie's apartment. Detective Leonard felt that Eddie was telling the truth. He knew what the crime scene looked like. He knew stuff that only someone there would have known. Donna and Jeannie's family say there was no evidence to support the sister's arrest. They done a blood test on Jeannie's car because Eddie said that he had rode in Jeannie's car. I took the car up there. There was no blood in the car, none whatsoever. I don't know how much blood Eddie had on him. Maybe they did just get lucky or they cleaned it up enough that we couldn't find anything, but we didn't find any blood evidence in her vehicle. Donna denied any involvement or anything to do with it. We told her that Jeannie was also a suspect, and she said, well, I hope not, but she is a liar. And Jeannie never changed her statement. They pleaded not guilty. I never offered nobody nothing or asked nobody to do harm to nobody for me. I remember seeing my mom being arrested at my grandma's house, walking away in handcuffs. That's a bad feeling. When Women Behind Bars continues. There was no evidence at all. No fingerprints in the car, in the house. There was none nowhere. There was only Eddie's testimony. And later. I want every young person to look at me and say, I don't want to end up like that. On July 18, 1997, Donna Duggins and her sister Jeannie Moore were arrested for participating in the attempted murder of Donna's husband, Dean. The third co-defendant was Eddie Morgan, Jeannie's occasional boyfriend. Morgan had confessed to police and claimed the sisters put him up to the crime. The girls sat very quiet and motionless. It was unbelievable to think that they were charged with this crime. I didn't eat for seven days. I didn't sleep. I didn't weigh but 95 pounds. And then when I got up on the stand, I felt like I was going to have a stroke. The prosecution's star witness was Eddie Morgan. Eddie's told on the stand he went in the house and hit Dean in the head 14 times with a claw hammer, using the claw part. He told the whole court that he was solicited. You could tell his story didn't have any flaws in it. He was very incriminating to the two sisters. The state maintained that Donna was the brains behind the scheme. She wanted Dean dead so that she could be with her boyfriend and collect on a $10,000 life insurance policy. Donna had several boyfriends. Her and Dean got separated. She had a couple of boyfriends in between that time. They showed phone records with a guy, a friend. I dated him when me and Dean was broke up. He become a good friend to me. I didn't see him like that. But the Brewer family insists that Donna knew that she was not the beneficiary of the life insurance policy. Donna did the uh, book work for us, and she knew that Dean had insurance, and the insurance was payable to his daddy, not to her. The prosecution also questioned Donna about the $1,000 she allegedly offered Eddie to kill Dean. They showed my bank statement, which showed $1,000 taken out of my checking account. But if they would have showed my two canceled checks, they would have showed it was my house payment and my electric bill. Jeannie tried to refute testimony of the witnesses who said they drove Eddie back to South Carolina after the assault. She admitted buying Eddie a bus ticket to restart their sporadic romance but she stuck to her story that she drove him back the day before Dean was hurt. I took him back Wednesday night because my kids said that he was acting crazy and that uh, they didn't want him there no more. So when I got off from work, 
I took him to his mama's and dropped him off in front of her house. And that's the last I saw of him and talked to him. But the prosecution exhibited phone records with calls made from her home that Wednesday evening. Jeannie countered that her niece often let herself in and use the phone. Records also showed phone activity between the sisters. Part of the evidence that was used was the frequent phone calls back and forth when Jeannie was telling us that they hadn't talked on the phone. They had a bunch of them, but that was normal. They might make a 1,000 phone calls to each other. It took the jury one hour and 20 minutes to come to a verdict. Only thing I can really remember is my daughter screaming out, oh, God, no. I was shocked. There was no evidence at all, no fingerprints in the car, none in the house. There was one footstep, but you couldn't tell nothing about it. There was nothing in Jeannie's car to, to prove that she was even involved in it. There was only Eddie's testimony. As far as I'm concerned, she got what she deserved. You might as well say she about got life, because so she's going to be 60-some years old when she gets out. I think Eddie should still be in prison for what he did and his role in it. He's out after 13 years, uh, and the two girls are still locked up. They all three should be locked up. Donna and Jeannie are serving their time in the same North Carolina prison. We keep out in distance. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love her. And I have to kind of stay on her to be strong because we can't let this get us. I have a beautiful daughter waiting on me. <laughs> I have to look out for both of us because she looks out for other people before she does herself. Their incarceration has been rough on the family. I was 14 when my mom got locked up. I was like a lost puppy. I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old, and it's just hard that she can't be there. I've had heart attack and three strokes in the last six or seven years. I had to close the plants down. People quit buying from me. We spent well over $100,000 trying to get help. Always been afraid that my daddy's going to die, you know, and I'm not going to get to be with him again. And nobody will know that what we was accused of and what we got sentenced for, we didn't do. Dean Duggins is still fighting to gain back all of his faculties. He and Donna have had no contact. I had to learn how to write. I had to learn how to walk again. And then I was having seizures, but I've got a new neurologist. I think he's got me on some good medicine. The only problem is it makes me incoherent. Donna and Jeannie continue to maintain their innocence. They wish the events of that night could have been different. I'm not saying what happened to him was right, because by no means, I feel, you know, it wasn't right. i probably come to prison and save my life. Could you sit down and say, why? I wasn't the one doing wrong. Why did it happen to me? But in other words, you look at it and say, well, you know, if you would have been out there today with him, what would he eventually done to you? Next up on Women Behind Bars, when three girlfriends abduct a woman, it ends with a fatal beating and a drowning. When she initially hit her with the hammer, the blood shot up on my foot. And I didn't know whether to run, to scream, to help. I was just stuck. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to wetv.com. On December 31st, 1999, the body of 20-year-old Lois Thomas was dredged up from the Little Calumet River. Lois worked as an assistant at a daycare center and had been missing for 11 days. She had a green cord tied around her neck. The water was so cold that it preserved her. She looked like you were looking at her sleeping. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation and drowning. 
Three days before, 18-year-old Evelyn Jackson and her friends, 22-year-old Marianne Arnold and 16-year-old Catherine Amos, confessed to police. Evelyn said she was just helping Marianne settle a score over a boyfriend. Originally, she said we were going to fight Lois because of her shooting at her and her kids. And it was like, you're threatening this lady's kids. Based on the fact that they had a gun with them, you could argue that uh, they planned to kill Lois. She said, if somebody asked me to fight, that's one thing she would do. She said, but killing somebody, she said, I had no idea. Evelyn started feeling like she'd made a big mistake and she should have never listened to her in the first place. But by then, obviously, it was too late. Was the murder of Lois Thomas a premeditated event by Marianne, Evelyn, and Catherine? Or was it a fight that got out of hand? The main thing that stands out with when I was a kid was the relationship I have with my brothers. We had to lean on each other for everything. She was spoiled. <laughs> she was very spoiled. I couldn't move. I, I, I literally could not move without her on my heels. I want my mommy. At age five, Evelyn says she accidentally started a house fire by burning a string of her new coat. Her older sister was trapped and could not be rescued. The tragedy would plague Evelyn for the rest of her life. My sister died from smoke inhalation. And over the years, I've blamed myself for her death. Evelyn's parents later separated, and she became the caretaker for her younger brother. Even though I was so young, I was the protector. I feel it's my responsibility to take care of the dirty work. I feel it's just in me to, to do that. Still, Evelyn hungered for a greater sense of belonging. The first time that I, I actually got involved with the game, I was 13 years old. I think maybe I was looking for a tight-knit family. It's the respect that you get from the other gang members. The teenager continued to grieve for her older sister. I believe that's what kind of triggered me to start using drugs and, and drinking to numb that pain. Once I started smoking marijuana, I didn't stop until the day I got arrested. I started selling marijuana at 15, and then I started selling cocaine. Evelyn's hard and fast lifestyle led to a pregnancy by 17. We both were crying. I didn't understand. You know, why would you do this to yourself? I said, you knew that this is the same road I took, and I didn't want this to happen to you. The expectant mother gave up the drug trade, but after her son was born, she went back to using. She felt like my mom always taught me, it's no more Evelyn, it's the baby. So basically, she got her own place. Not only was I taking care of my youngest brother, but now I have a son. So my natural instinct was to go back and start selling drugs again. I think I would probably had made a good 1500 a week. The money was more addictive than anything. Evelyn and her baby would sometimes share the apartment with 16-year-old Catherine Amos. Catherine, she stayed with me off and on. We shopped together, got our hair done together, things that sisters would do. and. I kind of protected her in some ways, too. We did everything side by side. We was like Bonnie and Clyde. The two would also spend time with 22-year-old Marianne Arnold. According to a police report, the single mother of three was receiving public assistance and served food at a nursing home. In a way, Marianne did step in to be that big sister that I didn't have. So it was like I was getting the big sister role from Marianne and the little sister role from Kathy. Evelyn finally seemed to have found her chosen family, but everything would soon fall apart. In the late fall of 1999, Evelyn's new sister, Marianne, and Marianne's boyfriend, Al Covington, were in the process of breaking up. Me and Marianne, we were separated for a couple of months. I had uh, decided to move back to the house with my parents and uh, left her the house with the kids. And there was another bone of contention between Marianne and Al Covington, 20-year-old Lois Thomas. One of Marianne's cousins had told Marianne that they seen me at the um, the movies with, with Lois. Lois was someone that everyone wanted to be around. She was very beautiful. She was just a close friend and everything. Lois was studying for a degree in childhood education and worked at a daycare center. She's a pretty girl. That's what I called her. She's a pretty girl. Couldn't ask for a better assistant. 
She worked very well with everybody. Lois Thomas had a job, no criminal record, very good relationship with her mother and her family, and seemed to be a really good kid. According to Evelyn, Marion complained that Lois was harassing her. She didn't say exactly why. She just said that it had something to do with Al. Mary Ann told me she had an altercation with this lady at the gas station and that this lady had actually shot at her and her kids. And then she tells me, like, a week after that, that Lois and her friends were outside of her apartment threatening her and throwing bottles at her apartment and stuff. So it's like, you're threatening these kids again. I believe that Lois Thomas may have been dating Albert. I don't think that they had a serious relationship, but I think they had some contact with each other. And I think that threw Mary over the edge. She said that Lois has shot at her and her kids. And when you threaten kids, somebody has to defend them. Because Marianne is so little, and she's so scared, and she's not used to the street life. She felt that I could protect her. The night before the incident happened, I stayed up all night selling drugs, trying to get the money together for my rent. And while I'm up, I'm constantly smoking weed, I'm constantly drinking. The following morning, Evelyn says she awoke to Marianne's frantic pleas for help. She was telling me, like, we can go catch her right now before she goes to work and fight her in the back of her house. But don't forget your gun, because she had a gun the last time. Evelyn claimed she was punchy from lack of sleep and alcohol and wasn't thinking things through. Automatically, I go and grab my gun. Myself, Marianne, and Kathy, we got in her car, and we went to the girl's house. And we sat there for maybe 20 minutes, and she came out. We were told that Lois Thomas walked out to her vehicle to warm up the car before she went to work. At that point, Mary Arnold, Evelyn Jackson, and Catherine Amos approached Lois Thomas' vehicle at gunpoint and took her out and put her into the back seat of Mary Arnold's vehicle. They drove around and made their way to the boat launch in Chicago. When Women Behind Bars continues. Mary Arnold was using an electrical cord to choke Lois Thomas while at the same time using the hammer to strike her on her head. I had to keep going with this because this is a lifestyle that I portray, so I have to, I have to stick to it. On the morning of December 20th, 1999, 22-year-old Mary Ann Arnold rounded up 16-year-old Catherine Amos and 18-year-old Evelyn Jackson. According to Evelyn, Marianne wanted help to rough up Lois Thomas, the woman she considered a rival for her boyfriend, Al Covington. The whole thing was brought up by jealousy. Two women uh, in love with the same man. Evelyn says she took her gun along to protect her friend Marianne. Me and Marianne were not the best of friends, but we were good friends. We hung out almost every day. All I wanted to do was help Marianne to defend herself. And they were just going to scare her. That's all it's supposed to be. A little before 7 AM, the three arrived at the victim's apartment and waited to jump her. Lois was warming up her car. This is where they took her at gunpoint and put her in the back seat of, of their vehicle and drove around uh, beating her. Mary Arnold was driving. Um, and in the back seat was Lois Thomas. Um, and on each side of her was Evelyn Jackson and Catherine Amos. Lois tried to grab the gun from me. And when she grabbed the gun, it went off. Shot the driver's side window out. Then that's when Marianne pulled behind a church, and she got in the back seat, and I got in the front seat. With Evelyn at the wheel, the group then headed to a nearby forest. The original plan was just to fight her, get her in the car go to the back docks of the Little Calumet River and leave her there. Never was our motive to kill this girl. Once they get to the boat launch, I think Mary Arnold has some idea of what she plans on doing. Evelyn understands that it's probably not going to be a good outcome for, for Lois. This is the uh, Little Calumet River where it passes 
the Cabobian Woods. It's also known for uh, the boat launch that's here. Can be secluded, especially this time of year when it's so cold. You can see the ice is probably anywhere from you know five to six inches thick. When they reached the docks, the three girls forced Lois out of the car and down into the icy river. They would have gone down into the rocks and made Lois walk through the boulders and the, and the glass with no shoes on until they got far enough down. Mary, holding a cane, ordered Lois into the water. Water was only knee deep. It wasn't even that deep of a water. Marianne and Lois is arguing, and me and Kathy are sitting there like, man, it's cold out here, let's go. I'm not paying attention to the argument because I don't even remember exactly what was being said. Marianne jumps in the water with her, and they're kind of tussling a little bit, and then Lois gets away, and she walks down further. Marianne began beating Lois with the cane. According to court documents, the three women returned to the vehicle. So I'm like, man, forget it. Just let's leave this girl here, and let's go. I got to get back home to my son. Evelyn claims Marianne had other ideas. She says her friend pulled out a bag containing a hammer, knife, cord, and a string of Christmas lights. Catherine's testimony states that Evelyn and Marianne then walked back to the bank of the river where Lois was attempting to escape. I wanted to help that girl so bad, I really did. I helped Lois out of the water. Then Marianne jumps up and grabs her from behind, pulls her down to the ground. Lois is holding on to me, so I'm almost falling, so I let go. And Marianne pulls the Christmas string lights out of her pocket, and she was like, tie this in a knot. I didn't know what she was going to do with it. I didn't know she was going to tie her hands. I didn't know she was going to tie her feet, because she was kicking and screaming, trying to fight back. So I tied it, and I gave it to her. I didn't know she was going to put it around her neck. I'd have to speculate that the main reason Evelyn didn't stop Mary was because whatever that friend wants you to do, um, you basically do it because you have that, that tight of a relationship. I didn't stop Marianne because I didn't know exactly what she might do to me, and I didn't want to feel like I was being a snitch. It was like I had to keep going with this because this is a lifestyle that I, I, I portray. Mary Arnold was using an electrical cord to choke Lois Thomas while at the same time using the hammer to strike her on her head. When she initially hit her with the hammer, the blood shot up on my foot, and it creeped me out. And I didn't know whether to run, to scream, to help. I was just stuck. Lois fell into the water. According to court documents, Marianne followed, continuing to attack her. Finally, she grabbed a rock and dropped it on Lois's head. I think Mary Arnold's anger just sort of festers as she's dealing with, with uh, Lois and, and ultimately kills her. The victim lay motionless in the water with the cord around her neck. It was never discussed that this lady was going to lose her life. If Mary Ann said, well, I want to go kill this girl, you do it by yourself because I ain't going. Evelyn and Mary Ann returned to the car, and the three friends drove away. That morning of the 20th of December, we had a field trip. And Lois wasn't at work. It was a phone call placed. And her mom went to go see if her car had left. And that's when she found the car was running. And one of the doors were open. I think Lois Thomas' brother made the 911 call. We were told by the family that there was an argument between Mary Arnold and Lois Thomas. We spoke with Mary Arnold, and she really sort of gave us the impression that they were actually pretty good friends. That threw us off the trail of her being a suspect. Police continued their search for Lois. A few days later, they received a confidential tip that the three friends had been talking about the murder. It was a sort of a domino effect where Catherine Amos broke down and then Evelyn Jackson broke down and then we used that to go pick up Marianne Arnold. Marianne Arnold was definitely the brains of the outfit. I mean, she was the big sister figure for the other two. When I initially admitted to my involvement and everything, it was like a release because that entire week I would be sitting there and I would see Lois's face in my closet, but I still felt guilty 
because I should have told something. During the days of the rescue efforts, uh, there would have been law enforcement vehicles from one end to the other. A group of us, co-workers, some family members, we actually went to the scene. We were just looking for any type of clues. Even Lois's mom went out to um, the Riverside. She held her composure very well. Her mission that day was to find her daughter. The weather was extremely cold, near below zero, and the divers were using saws, um, pickaxes, and scuba equipment to break through the ice. They were literally submerged in the icy water. We really felt that there was more of an importance to recover this body for the family so they could finally have some peace. 11 days after Lois was killed, a team of divers pulled her frozen body from the river. The autopsy findings showed that she died of strangulation with drowning as a significant factor. Lois's mom was devastated. She was heartbroken. Initially, all three of the girls pled not guilty. However, very early on in the case, Catherine Amos was able to uh, negotiate a deal because most of the violence occurred down at the riverside, and the facts did support her side of the story, which was that she stayed up by the car at that time. The state had enough evidence to prove the murder charges and the aggravated kidnapping charges against all three girls. But the state wanted to solidify their position against Evelyn and against Marianne. And in order to do that, they were interested in the testimony of Catherine Amos. According to state's evidence, Catherine corroborated the story that Marianne strangled and beat Lois while Evelyn was nearby. Faced with Catherine's damaging statement, Marianne Arnold pled guilty. She was sentenced to 80 years without the possibility of parole. Evelyn Jackson also pled guilty. The judge ordered her to serve 45 years. The plea agreement on Evelyn's case was done to avoid the possibility of a more harsh sentence. Two things make her, in the judge's eyes, more culpable than Catherine. Evelyn introduced the gun into the equation, and Evelyn also is alleged to have been the one who tied the Christmas lights into a knot. My heart fell in my shoe when they told me I was being in prison for 45 years because I had faith that I was going home because I knew that my actions had not caused this girl's life. Evelyn always maintained that she did not know it was a murder and that she did not want to participate anymore when it seemed that Mary was escalating the violence would have been different if she was sitting out in the vehicle, not having any involvement with what took place there. She may have gotten a better break, but she was right there at the scene where the murder took place, so she was definitely culpable. Evelyn is serving her 45 years at Dwight Correctional Center. I got my GED within the first eight months I was here. I've gotten my certificate in advanced computer technology and business management. I started beauty school because I love to do hair. The 28-year-old is currently appealing her case. My son, he's only 11 years old. He's my strength to keep trying to find different avenues to get out of here. Evelyn now believes that Lois never pulled a gun on Marianne. She has a message for young girls everywhere. I had to do this show and speak out to those that may see themselves going down the line of life that I lived. Please stop. I won't every young person to look at me and say, I don't want to end up like that. I have to apologize to my family. I have to apologize to Lois' family for putting them through that. I don't want nobody to end up like me. And I would never stop fighting.